Hi, Laura. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to give a little bit of context about this conversation and sort of frame what we'll talk about and why we're having this conversation and also welcome you to the podcast in general. And um, a, a few months ago, a friend of mine posted a question, two questions on Twitter. I, I hang out on Twitter a lot and they posted two questions on Twitter. It was one for men and one for women. And the one for men, which I answered was men, what distinctly female experiences do you wish you could have? And I gave my answer to that, which was sort of like this vulnerable, long, poetic answer. Um, and then someone responded to that saying, hey, that was beautiful. Uh, have you ever had your Akashic Records read? I was like, hmm, uh, no, I haven't, but tell me more. And uh, they ended up recommending you and I did a reading with you and was really impressed by that and intrigued by that and also have done uh, the first free tier of your Little Soul School uh, course online for how to access the Akashic Records. So I really wanted to dive deeper into that and learn more about you and your background and what the Akashic Records are. Um, and just in general on this podcast, I really love to start with having people share their life story, you know, in whatever way they want to or whatever length they want to, telling them us about themselves really on a personal level, because even though typically there are certain themes or areas of life that I'm interested in talking with someone about and learning more about, I find that someone's personal context and where they're coming from and what they've done in their life really informs that and, and provides a context for all of that. And so I just am so fascinated by who people are generally, and everyone has lived such different lives and uh, had just such different experiences. And so this is really a chance to get to know you and who you are, and then uh, talk more about the Akashic Records from that level um, as well. So um, yeah, with all of that sort of in the room, I'd love to hear from you. Anything you'd like to share about your background and your life story, um, who you are, and how you came to be here today? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, so I guess what I'll say to you just to get started is um, interrupt at will. And if you want me to go deeper or tangent into anything around the story, I'm 51. It's, it's a long story. So um, mm. uh, like I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll give you, um, you know, some broad ideas about what I've done and, and I'm happy to, to go as deep or go into whatever. So um, yeah, so I, I, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm I'm a funny person in that I I really started off my life like very playful, very happy. Like I enjoyed being under ten. I thought that was like an awesome experience. I was the kid running around with endless, boundless energy, quite frankly. And like school just did not appeal. Like the entire process of being for me, it felt like a confined animal. I just felt like I was dying in school. Um, and I was at an elite private school in Chicago. Um, and one should be a little grateful for that, but I, I just, I truly loathed every breath of being in a class environment. I didn't like being spoken to for hours, sitting still, you know, I didn't care about 98% of what was being also taught. I just had no interest. I mean, I, I'm bright. I was a bright little kid and, you know, they tested me to see if I had learning disabilities and I was just, I just didn't care though. And so I was that annoying kid that, you know, they'd say, anybody want to say how they're feeling today? And I'd raise my hand and say, I want to go outside and play, you know, <laughs> they're just like, oh God, stop. Um, and so I, I kind of got myself a little sidetracked in life. And um, because of that energy, I started, I started partying very young. I was in Chicago in the seventies. My parents <laughs> raised us loosely. I got to literally roam the streets of the south side of Chicago, um, untethered. You know, there was no cell phones. They didn't care where I was as long as I showed up for dinner. And and so I got into partying very young, 13, 14 years old, um, you know, very entertaining to me, but quickly became concerning. And around 16, I was like, okay, I got to get, like, get it together or I'm going to have some serious issues here. And while I had a good time and I don't regret it, it was a little on the edge of dangerous often. And I was sitting in an English class and, you know, dying as usual. And and the teacher presented Plato's symposium, you know, just like uh, later in, in high school and in, in, a, in a really sort of elite private school, 
I got the opportunity for things like that. And I don't know what happened. I had like full body goosebumps, full body. Like today I would describe it as my soul connected to what was happening. Back then I had no language, right? I was like, whoa, what the hell? <laughs> so I, um, I got my shit together. I started um, not just because of that, but a series of things. I started caring about school and I went to to college and I and I just signed up immediately for ancient Greek philosophy. I mean, this is a kid who could care less. And I just started to devour philosophy and I mean, straight A's. And it was, again, like I look back, it makes sense from the context of how I view the world today. But back then, I didn't really get it, I, but I would have these strange things happen where I would, I was in an, an advanced um, Kantian philosophy class. Kant, for those who don't know, makes no sense. He's notoriously impossible to read. He has a book that's like, you know, a thousand pages of garbly crazy for most people. I sat down, I opened up a couple pages and I went, I got it. I got it. And I went back into class. I explained it to everybody in there and they were like, what? Like what? And like people were coming to me and begging me to tutor them. And I was like, I don't know. I just, I just get it. Like I get this stuff. And today I would say, you know, I had learned it in a previous life and like, it just was a remembering, but I don't know. I, I sort of said, maybe I'm just talented with this. Right. I mean, but it was bizarre how, how easy it was. I went on to graduate school, um, top grad school in the country, and that was the sort of um, turning point um, around this deep passion, because while I loved it, I was 22 and I had this fantasy that the professors at Tufts University would take me in and it'd be like an apprentice moment and I'd be under their wing and I loved it and they loved it. And um, that was not, that was not the case. Uh, they they weed you out in graduate schools, you know, that's a notorious part of, of American graduate schools, at least, and definitely other countries. Um, I realized quickly that this thing I love to make a living at it, to become a professor, meant I had to become interested in not just Plato per, as an example, but Plato's particular dialogues and a particular thing in there and then have a perspective and then want to write about it and then want to argue with my peers. And I had this flashball moment where I saw um, myself looking across the country, thinking about the universities I'd want to work at because I like cities. It limited my, my options. And I was like, oh God, there's like 20 places I'd want to be. There's 10 philosophy professors. To get a job there, I'm going to have to make a particular point that they believe in to a handful of people who will understand what I'm talking about because it gets so granular. And I was like, oh my God, I, I, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I like, I, I again, I freaked out because this is all like, this is all I had considered because I was sort of a fuck up, right? In every other way, I was like, oh God. Um, and so in a series of very stressful in conversations with myself, some friends, some family members, I packed it up after two years and, and, I, and I left with like no plan B. I mean, nothing. Um, came back to Chicago, a very tail between my legs moment. And I moved in with my parents. I didn't get along that well with them a lot. So, um, you know, it was a little bit stressful of an idea. And my dad is old school and he's like, you're not living under my roof at 24 without a job. So I had like fashioned, I'd take the summer, find out who I was, take a minute. Um, and he was like launching a business, a healthcare tech business, because he figured out once you have kidney stones, how to prevent them from coming back. World famous, but his work wasn't being adopted by doctors nationally. So at 60, I give him a ton of credit. He, he wanted to start a company. And my brother was a, an entrepreneur at that point. He loved it. And he was all in and my dad's like, well, you're home, um, go downtown, go make yourself useful. Like literally. And I was like, what? Yeah, like I was unpacking quickly so I could spend the summer figuring my shit out, if, you know, and, um, and, and probably relaxing. Right. I just was tired from grad school. So I, the next thing I know, I came home on a Friday, I wake up on Monday and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm sitting in a tiny office somewhere in the edge of Chicago. My brother's not there yet. I'm alone. 
there's no Google. The internet was on modems. I have nobody to tell me what I'm doing because my dad's so old school. He was like, figure it out, legit. Which now I look back and I'm like, it's kind of cool that he trusted a 24 year old with his life's work and just said, go figure it out. But at the time I'm like, what, what am I supposed to do? I don't even know how to fill my day. So anyways, long story there, but um, short of long is I had a very, very strong talent for entrepreneurship. Like I just was good at it. I could figure stuff out. I would, I was suddenly running the IT department, which was 10 computers that I had strung together and I just figured it out. I don't know. I don't know how. And um, I, you know, entrepreneurship is a lot of problem solving, wearing a lot of hats. You know, I was the accountant and the biller and the tech person and, and, you know, I hate healthcare and I don't care about business. So, you know, I just, I'm good at building. I'm a creative builder, right? So we built out this model. I love my brother. I got to spend all this time with him. We'd chill out, have lunch every day. Um, and I built this company over 10 years. We created a new standard of, of care um, for chronic illness. Um, we sold our company to a Fortune 500. I met my partner. Um, we worked together as well. She started working at the company. And it was a nice life phase. Um, and I had my son. I had a I had a beautiful baby, uh, Nate. And um, I don't know, nothing was, was ever wrong. I, I had a really nice run of life, except nothing was quite right. Um, and I found myself waking up towards the end because my career had gotten so stressful. I was working, I was up with a baby at five in the morning and then working 10 hour days, which really I needed 11 or 12 to get what I needed done at that point. And then getting home to a baby and trying to deal with having a relationship and being a good friend and a daughter and, 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 and a sister. And I just started having panic. I started having panic. And so um, it was like a turning point that I didn't know was turning at the time. Like I can look back and see it, but I went to the gym and I was like, you know, I heard about this yoga thing and I heard that if you do it, it helps. And so I was going to do a real workout and then I would do a little yoga for fun to stretch. Um, I walked in and as somebody who was extremely athletic as a kid, I got my ass kicked. I mean, it was so hard. It was so intense. I was like dripping sweat. I was like moving in all these weird ways. And I was like, oh. I was like, I'm just hooked, right? I'm like, what the hell was that, right? And, you know, yoga has been around for thousands of years. I don't really get how it works exactly, but it, it started to change, right? It connected me and my body. I started doing a little more meditation. I was getting out of my head a little. And then I started connecting to this feeling like, oh no, you know, this isn't it. Like, this is not it. Something's off. Um, I sold the company. I was a fortune five. I was an executive at this fortune 500 that purchased us. And um, I had this moment where I, I had bought a house and I had a chocolate lab and I had the three-year-old kid in the relationship of 17 years. And I pulled up in front of my house and I looked at it and I was in my late thirties. And I thought, nothing's wrong. Like, this is perfect. Like, why don't, why don't I feel better? Right? Like, why don't I feel, why don't I feel what I think culture promises us when I have reached and attained certain goals, when my life looks a certain way internally, I will match the picture. Right. But internally I was having panic. I was like connecting back into myself and realizing something doesn't feel right. I don't feel very, and I kept saying authentic, authentic, something's not authentic. And, and it was just this word that kept beating on me. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I got really heady cause that's my process. And I was like, Oh yeah, like the biggest problem of the universe is facing me. What am I going to do? And what do I want? And why isn't it working? Um, and I don't know, after like two years of <laughs> banging my head against the proverbial wall of self-imposed stress and misery about the importance of my particular life decision, um, I, um, I was sitting on an airplane with my brother. Um, I was repeating once again, the stress of this, you know, all important decision of what to do with my life. And he just turns to me and he's like a really wise guy and a simple guy in, in certain ways. And he's like, you know, 
the world's a big place. Mm. Like, you don't have to do this. And it was like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I just went, oh, and like everything in my body released. And I, and I just started to sob. I mean, sob. I'm like on an airplane. We were coming back from a client and I, it like, I just broke. Like it was like all this stress of holding and pressure to like make a good or right decision. Just, and I'd started reading more spirituality. Like I'd always read philosophy, but I didn't get that into the spirituality side of things. And I was reading about how the universe, if you put things out, you know, you never, you know, maybe happens. And I was like, all right, fine. This is, isn't working my current plan. So I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to release it. I'm just going to release it. I want to leave my job. I'm going to let it happen. I want to be home with my kid. I was hating the fact that I wasn't raising him and a nanny had, had pretty much spent the first two and a half years with him. So, so I did. And I don't know, it was like the beginning of like this sort of magic or miracle of the universe and flow state. But, um, somewhere in July, my son was starting school in September. My nanny was quitting. I had no plan exactly what I was going to do all this. My brother calls me and says, Hey, the company that purchased us purchased us needs us to cut th like 300 grand from our budget. And we could do it with people or projects or whatever. But if you quit, that's a big piece and you'll get severance and you'll right. I was getting a package and I was like, he goes, but the thing is you've got like 48 hours to decide. You have to decide by Monday morning. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so this business I built, um, I just spent 14 years of my life. I built a building. I had 50 employees. I felt so completely responsible. I, I, I had 48 hours, right? Like that's not how I saw it going. And, and so that was like a big, one of the first big spiritual lessons, right? It's like you put it out there. It doesn't show up the way you want it to go. It shows up the way it's going to go. And so I don't know. I like stressed out. I knew it was what I needed to do. Um, I went into work. I quit. Um, it's a corporation of 27,000 people. So when you quit, you're out that day. Uh, so I had one day to get all my stuff, say goodbye to all the employees that I'd worked with. I had employees for a decade. Like people were very loyal to me. They're crying. There's like a instant kind of throw together lunch. And, and I was like, I was gone. Right. Um, and I woke up to, to no email, to no urgency, to no phone calls. I mean, it happens so fast. Like for people out there who've had big careers, it's, it's like almost traumatizing to go from that much, um, constant go mode to, to, to nothing. Um, and that was like the beginning of, of this whole phase of life. Like I, I left and I, I don't know. You can tell me how much you want to hear about it, but I, I was like, okay, I got time. I got money. I'm going to figure out what I want. How hard could this be? I'm, I'm a grown ass woman. Like I'm not 20. Like this isn't a big deal. So I started um, thinking about what I want. And what I realized is that that question brings really empowered, really strong people to their knees. Not what do I need to do? Not what's the right thing to do. Not what do I need to do to make money? What do I want to do? What actually like uplifts my heart, my soul? What do I feel connected? What is authentic, right? That was the word for me. So anyways, um, <laughs> I, I struggled. I, I started a yoga studio and I was like, nope, that's not it. I made one promise to myself. If it doesn't feel right in my body, I'm not doing it. Again, I didn't realize how profound of a thing that was at that time, but it was like the truth teller inside of me woke up, right? So I was like doing this yoga studio and I had a friend and we had a name for it and we were doing vision boards and I'm like, looked inside. I'm like, no, it's not it. <laughs> I don't want to hmm. run a studio. I love yoga. I don't want a yoga studio. And then the integrated healthcare systems at Northwestern had hired me to take over their brand new, like beautiful, beautiful uh, alternative care space. I said, let me sit, sit on it, sleep on it. And I couldn't sleep all night. And I was like, Nope, that's not it. <laughs> and I kept doing this until I was like, actually so embarrassed about 
how hard this was and how unsuccessful I was at finding what I wanted quickly, like it became its own shame point, right? Like, why is this so hard? Why can't I just figure this out? You know, I, like, I don't know. It was, it was rough. And so I don't know, in a, in a moment of just um, frustration, I'd always wanted to write. And I think I had forgotten how much I wanted to, like, I liked philosophy in grad school. I liked it in college. I liked writing about it. So I grabbed myself a laptop. I went to this beautiful atrium that became my writing space for years after that. Um, I sat down, put on some noise canceling headset and I tapped in and I, and I stared at this freaking word document for like three hours and I tried to write and, and I just was like imposter voice and freaking out and anxieties and oh my God, and I have nothing to say. And what am I doing? This is a waste. Why did I even leave my job? Like I was in it. I was in this deep struggle. Um, And then I don't know what happened. I got so frustrated sitting there when it was cold <laughs> and I just started typing and I wrote... <laughs> hope it's okay to swear a lot, but I just wrote, fuck this fucking, fucking document. I'm so sick of this fucking blank document. I can't stand it. And I just wrote like, you know, and like that kind of broke that tension. And I was like, all right. And then I deleted that. And I just wrote, and I wrote a page or two and it came somewhere from deep within me. And I was like, whoa. And I, and I, I sort of froze, right? Like I have that moment. And so I called my partner and I was like, whoa, something big just happened. And she was like, what? And I'm like, I, I don't know. And I started reading it to her and I started crying. Like I was like, oh, right? Like, oh my God, like this could be, this, like, this is it, right? It spoke so deeply to me. I didn't even write anything that meaningful, right? So that that was it. I I started a blog. I started writing. And I mean, I don't want to say that was it. Like turning point, everything was like wind at my back. I mean, it was it and a struggle. Like each thing I'd started to do, the imposter voice came with me. Like I had to shed all these layers of, of cultural norms about how I felt about myself, my identity. Um, but it was the beginning of this whole new chapter. Um, I wrote a book called Emotional Obesity, how do you strip back the layers between you and your authentic self? Cause that was me. Like it was a book, me working out my own shit. Um, started a blog. I, um, I started a podcast, the art of authenticity. Um, and I woke up five years later, you know, with a pretty, pretty cool online platform. Like the podcast went crazy. I had clients from around the world, um, that I would help them with this, right. Specifically, how do you ask, answer what makes me happy? And I started thinking about this idea of like, if there's a success trajectory that we are taught will bring us happiness, but doesn't. And there's this idea that passion means I'll be broke and right. Like I won't be able to have a life where I can even pay my bills. There's gotta be an intersection. There's just gotta be. And so what I learned was there is, and it's different for every single one of us. There is no authentic one life, right? And even within us, it changes over time, right? And so I, I you know, I learned coaching programs. I studied neuro-linguistic programming. I had done my yoga certification. Like I was just loving, I was like a little, you know, um, kid in a candy store. And I don't know, life was pretty cool. And <laughs> I'm being honest, I was like, it's like I cracked the nut, right? I felt like I kind of got it. Like I, like I, I think I got this authenticity thing. Like I felt a little, um, maybe uh, bulletproof, right? Which I think is a really bad place to say that you are, because that's when the universe lifts up the lesson and kicks your ass again. Um, so I, um. I was helping my partner through cancer. She unfortunately got stage two cancer and then stage four cancer. 
um, I was in the midst of this career. My son was thriving. My life was great. I was struggling with all of that, but handling it. And I thought, okay, well, it doesn't get better than that in life, right? Like you can't control what happens. Um, my partner ended up being fine. Like she got through it. It was a really tough three years. We ended up not making it as a couple. We separated. And I was like, despite all of these things outside of myself, not necessarily being exactly what I want in an idyllic sense, I wasn't struggling like I used to. I wasn't panicked. I wasn't up all night. I wasn't anxious, right? I was like handling life. So I thought, all right, I think I, think I got this, you know, like got life. Ugh. And so I, I left my relationship. Um, I went out on the dating apps and um, two things happened that year. One was um, I was looking to go deeper into this question of authenticity. And I didn't know what that meant. I just knew if I kept speaking about it the way I had been, I was going to slowly die inside because I had had the same version of that conversation long enough, right? Like I wasn't growing, I wasn't moving in it. And I just got interested, like what the hell is authenticity? What are we talking about? Like, what is an essence? What does it mean to go within oneself? What the hell? Like, what is that whole next, right? Like spiritual conversation really, right? So that became really pressing for me. And I went out on a dating app um, simultaneously in that same few month period. And who does this happen to? I mean, I had been on lockdown for 17 years the very first official date I went on, I had set up a bunch, but um, became the person that I fell in love with. Um, I think on our third date, we we looked at each other and our eyes met over a fire at a hotel. We both know the moment and something connected in our souls and like truly broke something open within me. Um, so I'm simultaneously looking for that next level connection to self. And I'm finding this sort of soul spiritual connection to somebody else that's breaking it open in me. Um, and then within a few months, I'm introduced to the Akashic Records by her as well. So all of that's happening in a very, very short window. And so here I was thinking, I got it. And Oh my God. I mean, I start a five-year process of like breaking down to breakthrough, right? That's really all I can say about it. Um, so you with me on the story? Am I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I uh um I don't know, Tesh and I like I um I think I went into probably one of the hardest and most beautiful phases of my life. Right. Um, and hard meaning really breaking, breaking my heart, breaking down, breaking into myself w was one of the most difficult things, right? It's difficult in a different way. It's not difficult, like maybe the way that my work life was, but it was difficult, like, a like, um, um, in a vulnerability sense, right? Like, getting to know oneself at that deepest level. So, um, I, um, I met my twin flame. If people who don't know what that is, it's the idea is that when we are, um, created as a soul, our soul, if you look at Plato's symposium, which the irony that that was the thing that woke me up was the thing that happened later, which there's so many of these now in my life, but, um, the other half of your soul is your twin flame. Soul mates are like people you travel with in different lives. Twin flame is one person. It's one other, um, one other energy. It's not another soul. It's not a person. And when you meet in life, it's to help heal and grow and learn and evolve. Um, it's not to um, necessarily just have this easy soulmate kind of relationship. And so the love is unconditional. The 
the interaction looks slightly toxic because you unintentionally um, highlight the most unhealed parts of each other. Hmm. Yeah. So what does that mean in real life? I, um, <laughs> I mean, here we are, we're over a fireplace. It's so romantic. Our eyes meet, right? And it's so beautiful. We fall in love and, and, I went home that night and I was like, what's happening? Like, I don't read poetry. I don't write poetry. I don't like poetry. I don't understand poetry. And I wrote a poem about our soul the next day. Like it literally just came through me. And I, I didn't even know enough about poetry to know it was well-written. I was told later by people who study it, they're like, Jesus, like, that's amazing. Apparently woke up a dormant life of mine where I was a poet. <laughs> I knew about her soul because this is my twin flame. I mean, I wrote something so profoundly um, um, unique about her that there's, I mean, there would be no way I could have known it. Um, and then the next day she's like, I'm in love with you. Right. And then the next week we broke up <laughs> Well, wow. and that's how it went. Like how it's gone for, for five years. And so um, the breaking up was because we would, we would trick, you know, you trigger the person you're with, like it's a normal part of a relationship. Like we triggered each other without awareness constantly to a place where one of the two of us were like, I'm out, I'm out. And the out part was to go confront whatever it was within yourself while you blame the other person and you say, well, it's their fault. You eventually realize no, it's me. <laughs> and then there's a healing, right? So here I am thinking I've like mastered life. I've got this authenticity thing. And I am like within months, I'm literally like, like so on my knees with this person. And I'm like, oh my God, you know? Um, and I didn't know what to do with my career. So that's on hold. So I'm really just like this drama queen, like drinking martinis with my soulmate, my twin flame. Um, breaking up, getting together. I think my friends are like, oh my God, she's like having a midlife crisis. Right. But, but I, I was, it was really awakening to something deep within myself. I didn't know that. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Maybe I need like a team of coaches. It was really an uncomfortable uh, phase. And, um, and so about six months into knowing each other, we made a commitment finally to be with each other. So here we are newly committed. Um, we, she's always wanted to do Akashic records. She never went until meeting me and then said, I think we need to do this. And I was like, all right, I don't know. I'm down. Like, I don't know what they are, but sure. So we walk into an Akashic record reader on a beautiful spring day. And I sit down across the room from this lady and she said, what's your name? Which is how an Akashic record goes. And I'm like, tell her my name, Laura Susan Co. And she just starts slamming me with these truths. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I didn't know what it was. She didn't tell me anything. Right. And she tells me about my son and she tells me about these little books of poetic prose, which I, by the way, have written now that she knew I was going to write. And I was like, I've always wanted to write that. How do you know that? And then She's like, oh my God, you have met your other half. Like, oh my God, the love. And she starts freaking out. She's like, oh, oh, it's like endless. And oh my God, like roots of a tree that go down forever. And you've had 135 lives together, blah, blah, blah. And you guys fight, but you can't even get down the hall without forgiving each other because it's such a profound love. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Anyway, so now imagine she goes in, she has a reading, told similar things. We're new to a relationship in the earth plane, in the real world. People don't talk like that in the first six months. So we look at each other. It's like, do you want to get a drink? Yeah. And it was like, what did she say to you? And it's like, I don't want to share. Do you want to share? I mean, who wants to say that? That's ridiculous, right? So we admit like, I don't know. She said something about us being you know, twin flames and you know what I mean? And it's like, well, did she say that to you? Yeah. Well, something around a lot of lives. Yeah, no. Yeah. Definitely a lot of lives, like 130. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the way we're just like, oh my God. But we, but we knew, we knew, right. I had said when I was young, I don't know what it is, but I know I'm going to be with a dancer before I die. 
Mm. And she's a dancer. I just used to say it. And I'd be like, I don't know why I feel that way. Right. According to the Akashic realm, the Akashic records are the energetic space that holds your soul's history. That's what I came to learn. And according to this realm, you have a soul plan before you come here. You decide what you want to do, who you want to do it with, what lessons you want to learn. And then these little tiny knowings inside of yourself, I'm going to be with a dancer, or I just know that I want to do this job, or I know that I don't, or this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel this authenticity thing. That's your soul's knowing and hinting to you <laughs> gently about what you wanted in this life, right? So, um, so yeah, I... I did that. We started doing them like crazy. Well, I was like pushing it like crazy. I was, I was just borderline obsessed. I'm like, what the hell was that? And as a almost atheist, I grew up, I grew up atheist. My parents, um, my dad's a doctor. They don't believe in anything. I was agnostic, but, um, but this blew my mind. I mean, I was like, what the hell? I like, I, I, that was truth. I could tell. Right. So I started doing them. We went to New York. We're in Soho. We like bought a Tibetan bowl to do sound therapy on the streets of Soho. We're messing around with it. And we call the Akashic record reader and she um, gets on the phone and, and we do a reading from New York. And she's like, I see Tibetan bowls in sound therapy. And I'm like, come on, right? Like, come on. Nobody knows this. We just did it today. And it kept going like that. And so enough truths had built up where when the Akashic realm suggested I could take a class and learn how, I was like, huh, like, don't see myself that way. Completely didn't feel that was a path for me. But I was like, okay, let me let me go give that a try. Um, so I I I did. I I learned it. Um, I studied it like crazy. Um, I was terrible at it, to be totally honest. It did not come naturally. Uh, I took one workshop and mostly like was self-taught, but I started, I started doing it like every single solitary day. Um, and, um, practicing on every friend I could possibly practice on. And then I started teaching friends and I was like, if I can learn this, I wonder if I can teach my friend how to do it. So I taught some friends and I taught more friends. And then I was like, this is so weird. It feels like I can teach anybody and then I taught this men's group and it was a group of guys like accountants and lawyers and investment bankers who do not think they're mystical. And all 40 of them were able to do it. And they were brought to tears, like, like cute little bro tears, right? They were just like, <laughs> like they were like, oh my God, dude, dude, dude. And they would cry. And I was like, that's so cute. Um, and it was like this turning point again, where I'm like, oh shit. Like, I think we're all tapped in. I think we're all mystics. Like, I think everybody can do this just like we can all go to a piano and bang away. You got to practice and some have more talent than others, but like, nonetheless, we can all give it a run. And same with mysticism. It's not for um, a special few people, right? A, a gifted group. Um, so I started teaching more and more people. I started doing Akashic record readings. Um, and then I realized one day, um, my twin flame and I were having yet another moment of misery. And she wrote me this <laughs> text and said, um, uh, no strings, no expectations or something. And I was like, what does that even mean? I don't even know why she texted it. And I was irritated and I was in my Akashic records, uh, journaling. And I wrote in frustration, like, what are expectations anyways? And I got an answer and I didn't just get an answer. I got like this poetic prose, beautiful, like, what the hell was that? Like the deepest, coolest, most gorgeous um, perspective. And as a philosophy person, I was like, oh my God, that was good. Right? Like I knew philosophy and I was like, that was good. <laughs> and so I started channeling. Um, I would go in the records for hundreds of hours and and I wrote um, 10 books, actually, well, 12 books in total. Three of them are published, but I'd ask, what's the nature of love? What's the nature of faith? What's the nature of control? And um, I'd get these answers. And so um, I, I did that. And um, and then I started this uh, little soul school. Um, I wanted to build community 
around spirituality. Cause as I was breaking down and breaking through and breaking down and breaking through and the part of the story that I'm not telling you, and I can give you as much detail as you want is just the tremendous heartbreak that this process was for us. And then the heartbreak leading to an expansiveness. And, and every time I would feel heartbroken from the breakups, I would seem to learn some lesson, surrender, faith, right? Well, the things I was writing about were in part because I was struggling with them. And then I would wake up to a a better understanding and a, and a more expansive view of myself in the world. And, um, and so I wanted to help create a community because as you walk into spirituality, <laughs> it's beautiful. It's a nice way to live, but it's so disorganizing and so stressful in a sense to lose your identity, to lose sense of who you are, to relearn potentially this idea that you're not anything and the world is not anything like what we might have been educated into believing happiness isn't joy isn't self isn't it's not cute like you're really struggling so the little soul school is this space where i teach the akashic records in community um but i also am trying to create community where people who are not um woo woo -y, like really hard to connect to or total atheists or absolutely into religion feel comfortable, right? Like I'm just interested in self-exploration. Like I feel like a pretty normal person that just wants to explore this in a vulnerable, safe space with other people. I realized that I was struggling to admit it to my friends. Like I joke that I, I came out in the nineties as gay and coming out as spiritual felt <laughs> harder because <laughs> people were like, you're, you're uneducated or you, you know what I mean? Like, like religious people are like, what is that? It's not God or right. Like there's that, or like, um, sort of more atheist minded or, or intellectuals are like, well, that's uneducated of you. So you're, you're like, where do I fit in culture? Right. And I found out there's like so many people who feel this way and they're looking for a place to not feel shamed about what they do. And so, so that's what the, that's what the latest thing is, is like, um, how do I create community around that support people, teach them the Akashic realm, show everybody that they can be mystics in hopes that if everybody feels tapped in to this energetic space, perhaps, they will um, know that they're all connected, right? If we're all connected, if we all can connect, then we are all, all connected. It's my hope. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of like, that's that's my, my long-winded, you asked, <laughs> 50 years. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing so fully and yeah, uh, offering this story of your life it's really beautiful to hear and just give so much context and uh, yeah, just was there with you on every turn of the corner. And yeah, I loved, I love hearing these. So thank you. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe I'll start by, well, I'm, I'm very curious about a few things, but to start uh, how to put this, I don't even know what the question is, but I, I'm, I find myself curious about this period from like 13 to 16, where you were like partying a lot. And like, what was, what was that? What, what do you think appealed to you about that? And what was, what was that time of your life like? Mm. What appealed to me? It's such a great way to ask, right? Like, um, because there's no judgment in it. I, um, I do think I'm a free spirit. I think I came here in this lifetime to really express freely and I think being young, I felt free. My parents weren't controlling in terms of, in, in a bunch of ways. I mean, they were in certain ways, but like, I really, really could just roam and be and live. And I think the constructs of life felt um, hard for me to think about. I When I read Plato at 16, an, another part that I had read was this one line, every seeker um, uh, uh, learns that, you know, their soul is being chained to this earth right plane it, it, it's like 
I remember thinking like, oh God, like the system, the school system is going to, to, I will forget who I am. I don't know. How, like, I really did think that at a young age, like I'm going to get indoctrinated into beliefs about who I am and, and I will not remember. And that did happen, but I think I was in a rebellion around some of these things. I also was struggling. I was in a really elite school and my family wasn't motivated around um, supporting us. So, you know, we weren't given some of the the parental support that we needed to function in such a highly stressful school environment. So I think I was just kind of playing like the too cool for school kind of kid. Like I didn't want to admit that school was hard. So I was like, eh, I don't care, you know? So there was like a combination there. Um, I loved being social and I loved my friends and we were just all so high. Listen, everybody partying can, can, ultimately become a problem and it can be to numb out pain. It's also fun. People are doing it because it's fun. And so I was having a good time. I mean, also, I mean, you know, there's a lot of really entertaining days in there. So it was kind of this confluence of, of feeling lost, um, not having sort of the, the family that I needed to help me out and, um, the pressure of these school systems and, and, and just kind of entertaining myself, if I'm being honest, right? Until it wasn't. And I and I do know that for me, there was this moment where I was like, this isn't just fun anymore. This is getting dangerous and concerning. And I didn't want to go to rehabs or have problems or whatever. I like, that wasn't the goal for me. So, or or I shouldn't say goal, but I didn't have a traumatizing enough childhood that that was the path that I probably, you know, wouldn't have had a choice, but to walk, like, I think for some people, um, you know, they experience like early childhood traumas and these escapes or solutions are helpful for the pain they're in if they don't get the right support they need. So that wasn't true for me. I, I could get myself out. So I did. Hmm. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad I asked and that you answered because it feels like it's it's an interesting piece of the puzzle. So thank you. Um, yeah. What do you think resonated with you so much about reading Plato and the symposium? You know, uh, when when you had that experience, what do you think resonated so much for you about it? I mean, now because of the Akashic records and getting readings. So when you go in the Akashic realm, you learn about your past lives, who you are, who you are on a soul level, right? Um. But I, I read that and it gave me body, full body goosebumps. At 20, I went to, um, uh, I did my junior year semester abroad in Rome. And then I went to Greece and I stood at the list at 20 and I was like, ah. like, I just had another one of these moments, right? I was like, what the hell? I feel like I've been here. And I started wearing, in fact, I just pulled it out not too long ago. And it's funny, I have it on today, but mm. I have this um, cute little coin from Greece and it's a ancient um it's an ancient language that's never been deciphered. And I just, there was so, Greece and, and that place. I, 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 I mean, I definitely have had past lives there. Like this is just, um, true on a soul level for me. Mm -hmm. Um, the, you know, when I look at art and I see, uh, Raphael's school of Athens, um, um, I spent a semester at an arts program in Rome and I had to do one art project. And I picked that the school of Athens where it was, Plato's view of, of what happens in our afterlife. So I think I had a life where I was there. Um, people have hinted that I might've been one of the lead characters of that time. I, it, I don't know. There's, there's debates about, um, Socrates or Plato or these people, like, you know, can there be soul fragments of them in multiple people or something? I don't know that I understand it enough, but it, it speaks to me on a soul level. Cause it, it's part of me for mm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You described this long period of your life where you were pursuing authenticity for yourself and then starting to share, helping that with others. And you're kind of like, yeah, I've got this figured out and, you know, I've got this all together. And then that's that sort of illusion was, uh, you were robbed of that illusion eventually. And I'm curious, and this is a two-part question. How did you kind of understand what authenticity was at that time during that period of your life? And what have you learned since then that uh, mm. that's sort of changed for you? Mm. You're such a great, such great questions. I'm so excited by these. 
Um, because they're so deep and I, I love going deep. Uh, okay, so authenticity, what I felt it to mean back then was um, there's a way in which when people talk about themselves, they point to the middle of their chest. They said, you know, well, me, here, I, right? The sense of self, right? Um, what is true for me, we point here, right? We don't usually point to our head. We consult our head a lot. We think our head is the answer, but most of us have this sense of self. And so I thought of authenticity as a connection into that sense as the guiding principle of your life. And so instead of asking my head what to do, I check there. And um, um, it's not that the mind isn't helpful, right? The mind is extraordinary. It's just the thing with which this sense within yourself communicates itself into the world. Okay, so how do I feel about it? What is true internally? What feels authentic, right? What is um, a sense? Do I want to go to the grocery store? How do I feel about that? Right? <laughs> do I ask my brain? Well, my brain's going to tell me, well, you should go to the grocery store because you need to. Because And then equally, will give me crap about it because the brain loves to cover all sides and kind of you never feel good about yourself ultimately it's not a particularly great system for self-worth so decisions what is true in this moment for me come from here and then i use my mind to communicate to i mean obviously the the brain speaks language it shows me how to get there like i it, it does all the other stuff but the truest self is is there and so I taught people a system, red, yellow, green, um, for people who are really heady. Uh, you think about something that you love, right? Somebody you love, something you love. Uh, do you love, I love tennis, green, just tag it green. And so I bring people back into their bodies. What do you mean you love tennis? I don't know. I just do, right? I love being a mom. Why? I don't know, right? Like there's this stuff that's just true, you know, right? And if you sat here and you tried to tell me for five hours, I do not love my son. I'd be like, you're weird. You're annoying. Eventually I'd be like, I don't want to be around you, but it wouldn't change it. Cause it's so true for me. And then there's stuff that I don't like, like fundamentally putting me in a uh, convention center by an airport with a lot of people and no windows and air conditioning is like hell or mosquitoes. That's another hell for me. Why? I don't know. Just don't. When you tell me I'm going to go do that, I feel heavy and crabby and, you know, and you could tell me like, no, Laura, you do love it for a long time. And I'd be like, I don't, I just don't camping. I don't want to go. I do not. I like a really beautiful hotel. Like it's just <laughs> does not feel good to me for whatever reason. So that's what I believe authenticity is, is when you are making micro and macro decisions from within yourself and you use your mind to, to get it done um, instead of, I mean, I mean, I can say all day long, like it is true for me that I want something and then the logistics of life makes it difficult. So the brain and the heart will work together, but, but I'm leading my life from there. It's the ultimate decision maker. What I've, what I've learned, <laughs> it is that it's so much more, it's like so much more, right? Um, so the, uh, the, the way that I see it today is, um, if you, if you think of a flower, right, there's um, a flower that's like uh, blooming in, in a field somewhere, right? There's, there's the energy, the life force that moves through the flower and that flower expression be, is say a rose. And then there's a tulip and then there's a, you know, a bush that grows grapes or something. I don't know, right? Everything has this energy with that flows through it. Or if you want to think about like light, I think that's an easier one. Uh, lamps, like think of every form of light in your house. Electricity is moving through it. And then this illumination is expressed through this thing. And so now what I think the authentic self is, is that there's this life force energy, the oneness energy of all things, everything that wants to express through, that is expressing through the unique embodiment called Laura, right? This brain, this body and all this stuff is the lamp <laughs> that this oneness energy is glowing through and the mind gets in the way and dims the expression 
by telling me I shouldn't and can't and won't and people will and da 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 da. But that that living authentically means that I am allowing this energy that that wishes to express to express through as fully as it can. And that I'm illuminating as much of that energy through the expression of Laura in this lifetime. And that similar to the idea of snow and a snowflake, right? Like snow is the the one thing and the flakes are the individual um, unique imprints that this energy of oneness life force um, is the snow. And then there's this unique imprint of my soul that is expressing through this particular uh, incarnation of self in this life. And that it's here to learn or grow, to evolve itself um, through multiple lifetimes until it it completes its life cycles. And then I say all that to you with this like big asterisk, asterisk, asterisk caveat that is the best way I can say it with the confines of being embodied with language because there is really no way to express it. It's outside of language. Um, and so the the truth for me is I, I have this tattoo on myself, this still point of the turning world, um, and it's T.S. Eliot's poem he won the Nobel Prize for. And it's it's that. It's, it's that he says, there is the dance, but I can't say where, right? Um, I can't place it in time. And, but do not call it fixity, right? It's not arrested in its movement. He's trying to explain this thing, this this energy of self, um, and that that's expressing through. And and so I mean, he he wrote a great poem about it, and that's his best way of saying it, right? But but I think language will never really get us there. But that's the best I got. Hmm. Hmm. You've sort of touched on this a little bit just now, and at other points in the conversation, but I kind of want to zoom out and just ask like, how do you as yourself in your own life currently understand what the universe is? Yeah. So the ultimate like wisdom, according to Plato is that I know nothing, right? Like, <laughs> so I again say this with the like, ah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Right. Um, but I do think it's a worthy thing to try to express this stuff because we are living. Um, I think the, the universe is, is energy. I think we're, it's, there's a fabric of energy that is, um, like air, right? So you're breathing and I'm breathing, right? I don't breathe in and then say, oh, my air just went into my lungs. And I don't exhale it and say, oh my God, what just happened to my exhale? Did you inhale it? Right? We just have air. It's just this flowing thing. I think the universe is like that. And I think it's unconditional love. I think that we have an extremely bizarre view of love, that it's like this romantic grabbing hold of, resisting, not good enough, da 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 but I think the fabric of the universe is the energy of, of love and it's available to all of us in all places at all times. And it is us, right? Like, like I always have air inside of me or I'm not going to be alive. Right. And it's always in motion and it's moving in and out and in and out. And, and when we're in right relationship to the universe, we are moving with it in motion in flow and, and like, that's it. That's the whole experience. And, and then life unfolds, right? In this thing we call time. But I, I don't even think that's a thing. I think we call things future and we call things past, but that's just so we organize our human life so we can show up for this call. And, and there, that's true. Like there's a construct of time that makes me here for you today at the right time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it, I don't think it's actually real. I think that we are just in this repetition of presence in relation to this flowing energy of life that is unconditional love. And it's not mine or yours. It's not like um, something that belongs to us, right? It's just, it's just like the flow of, of oxygen moving around. And if we could get in that kind of relationship to it, 
I think life would be a lot easier. Um, and if we knew that we are it, right. What do you think makes life easier about that? Having that perspective? Well, you know, like I said, with air, um, if I know that I am the universe in motion with an abundant connection to it, and all I have to do is just keep breathing it in and out, just like I do with, um, with oxygen, there's not much to it, right? It's sort of there's a simplicity, but the mind gets involved and says things like, okay, so when it comes down to me expressing myself, um, am I going to be rejected? What, what, what are people going to say? What does it mean? What did you do with my expression of myself? Did you throw it away? Did you take care of it? Do you care about it? Do you care about, what does that mean about me? And now my self-worth is on the line, right? I don't do that when I exhale. I just exhale. I'm not like, hey, where are all those molecules going? What did you do with that molecule? Like you didn't appreciate it, right? Or, oh, I don't want to exhale because, you know, maybe it won't be inhaled. So I'm just going to hold my breath till I die, right? Like you die, like you literally die, right? So what I think makes it easy is just knowing that the mind has this like calculation and organization around it where it ties it to your worth, right? And then it asks these questions like about your lovability <laughs> instead of like, you no, know, I am, I'm, I'm the breathing embodiment of it. That's of course that's lovable because it is love. Mm. Now mm. you may not appreciate it. You may behave in ways that, um, that's your, that's a reflection of your relationship to it though. It's not a reflection of me. And I think that's where we get into just extraordinary amounts of, of trouble and pain, right? I do. Yeah. Hmm. Again, you sort of spoke to this earlier, but if you were meeting someone totally new and they're like, Hey, Laura, what are the Akashic records? What would you tell them about them? Well, I mean, I have it every day. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I, got, I got to say this constantly and frequently. Um, it's like funny. What do you do for a living? And I'm like, here we go. Uh, the Akashic records, simply put, are the energetic space that holds your soul's history. Everything you've ever done in all of your lifetimes, all of your lifetimes is stored in this. Think of it like a, like a data warehouse, right? Like the internet. Um, and um, all of ours are, not just yours. And um, this place, this is not tangible. It's not like an actual data warehouse, but it's like that. It's um, some, I don't know, some energetic spot. I don't know, right? Like nobody knows what it is. Quantum physics kind of like hints at some of it, but nobody really has understood it. It's been around for thousands of years. Akasha is primary substance in Sanskrit. Um, the Old Testament, New Testament, they call it the book of life. Um, but there's this idea that that our soul's history is being recorded somewhere. And um, it's governed by something called the Lords of the Records. Uh, they're non-embodied entities that, that keep it safe. And your masters, teachers, and loved ones um, who are on the other side um, will... Um, offer this information to you through an Akashic record reading so that you can connect back to what it is on a soul level you wanted to do in this lifetime. So you can get unstuck, right? Like we get, we get here <laughs> and life is hard. Being embodied is hard. So it's a, it's, um, it's, it's an opportunity to reconnect to your soul and what you wanted. So your soul can continue to do what it wanted to do, grow, heal, learn, move forward. Hmm. Um, how do you, or how does someone access the Akashic records? Yeah. So there's a lot of systems out there. Um, and it's been around for a long time. People have done it through meditations and hypnotherapies. And I mean, you know, there's a long list. I was trained with a set of, a set of sentences, um, I have my own, the Akashic realm gave me my own. Um, so 
sort of think of a cell phone. You have the same cell phone, but you plug in different friends' phone numbers, but you use the same phone number, uh, same cell phone. I use the same sentences. I just plug in a full legal name or another one, and it opens up one Akashic Records uh, or another Akashic Record, the uh, one person's energy or the other's. And it's kind of simple, um, it, this technique for me and for most people I teach. And um, from there, you receive information in the form of metaphor um, or so it comes through auditorily, visually, or feelings. A lot of it is metaphoric and, and you, um, yeah, you connect to the other side and, and receive this information. How does it uh, relate to or differ from other forms of like channeling or things like that? Yeah. I'm asked this like constantly in classes that I teach, like what's the difference between mediumship or psychics or channeling or, 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 right. And there's a long list. It's like, what's the difference between Reiki and massage, right? Um, Reiki is for energy healing and massages for your muscle <laughs> more, <laughs> um, maybe your lymph system too, right? Like, so they're, they're kissing cousins, but they're not the same. So the Akashic realm is strictly the energetic space that holds your soul's history. A medium is connecting to one person that deceased or two or three. Um, a psychic is predicting the future. The Akashic realm does not have as much of a predictive quality to it. So can you go in the Akashic records and have a mediumship moment? Yes. Can you go in the Akashic records? Right. So you're opening up an opportunity to, to connect to a guide or, but when you're connecting to the Akashic realm specifically, you're getting the information for you to help you connect back to your soul's journey to move you forward versus connecting to a deceased one or channeling. Um, I channeled from the Akashic realm, but it's also, you can channel from a particular guide, right? So it's like that. Hmm. Have you explored any other forms of channeling or working with specific guides or things like that? Not me. No, I've, um, I found this really works for me. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, when I'm in there, I've had mediumship moments. Um, so that's been interesting. And certainly there's been like guidance that seems to come more specifically from a very particular part of, of the realm. Like, but I, I, I don't know, some people see a literal book that they open and it's like reading somebody's soul's history. Some people have guides that step forward who tell them some people see Akashic beings. It's not for me. I, I just, I seem to get a connection of like white light energy and it just seems to flow through regardless of what I'm doing um, from, it feels like collective consciousness is all I can say. And um, it's more than enough for me at the, this moment. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't feel, I experiment with other things for myself. Like I go, um, I've tr I, like, I love trying everything, but as far as becoming a practitioner, that's not out of interest at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about what your subjective experience of accessing the Akashic records is like? Like going into them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, the best way to describe it is dreaming. So you go to bed at night, um, you go into this place with like, like this sort of weird experience, right? And you try to tell your friend about it. And it's like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me think, let me think. It was it was like I was in this room, but I mean, it wasn't like a room. It was like, how do I say this, right? There's this frustrating quality about a dream. The Akashic realm is sort of like that, right? Like you're like, okay. So I, I get the sense that I'm seeing a flower, but are you seeing a flower? No, it's not tangibly like I'm looking at an actual flower. I have this dreamlike sense of a flower. So, so I go in and I close my eyes and you drop into this very deep meditative space, space. Um, not because you're a meditator, you don't need to meditate. You just, you just do the minute you open the records. It's like, like people drop in. Well, after you've practiced at the beginning, you wrestle with your ego constantly. So just, just know if you're starting like, um, and you don't meditate and you're not a healer, it, it can be 
grueling at the beginning because you're dr- dropping in and, and it's a sensation to find it. But after a while you drop in, you feel this sensation, a connection at the top of your head, you're connected in and you start to experience visuals, auditory and feelings in your body that come in the form of, of, of metaphor or strict dialogue, like where it's telling you the answer. And it's the more you speak, the more it flows and this sort of dreamlike space that you inhabit um, eventually, unlike a dream dream, lands on these profound truths that the other person like becomes like, I don't know what to say. Like it's like a catatonic frozen face that I look at with 90% of people I read. The brain shuts down because the brain's like, well, at first it's like, how, how does she know this? And then it just can't because it's so particular and so deep and it speaks to the soul of people and people's hearts and they just open up and they're like oh my god she's speaking my language and it unlocks these truths of why you're stuck what your purpose is what's going on in your life who you are and it's like oh my god if you got a team of therapists a guru and all of my best friends together they wouldn't have said that i can't say it and so it's it's like a cathartic breakthrough over and over and over for like the whole hour. Um, and it, and it sets you, sets you free. So for, for the person experiencing it, it's like that for the person in the records, it's like this dreamlike quality lands on these truths that it's like, I I would put my life on the fact that I'm saying the truth. I know it's true. I don't know why the fact that I'm seeing like a elephant charging through a field, with a mask on and like I did this reading for this woman and it was a it was a cat standing behind a yarn ball and her family were a line of cats and then this cat had goggles on and the goggle cat like turns around and there's this smoky field I mean it's freaking bizarre like dreamlike and I translate each quality each each image and she's like sobbing because it's her truth about her family it's the goggles represent her relationship to uh, walking in her own truth or something, right? Like, I don't remember, but, um, and so each little part translates into some truth that it's, it's like a knowing, like, like nothing else. Like I, Mm. like, I know I'm wearing a blue shirt with some, you know, stripes on it. Like it's that level. You're like, no, I know this is right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you, I'm sure this happens sometimes too, but say someone comes to you and they're like, I don't believe any of this and this soul stuff and reincarnation and you're just full of crap. Like what What would you, I mean, I suppose you can't just like convince someone like that, but is there anything you would say to someone like that? Just try it for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I'm like, I, I mean, I'm the worst. I, I was the worst. I, I ran these experiments. I mean, I would call a brand new reader and I'd be like, my name is Lorca. What do you have to say? Like I was just so obnoxious and I wouldn't tell them anything and I would try to trick them and and I would get the same answer. Mm. I taught people one-on-one for a long time and I asked the same question to like 200 people and I got the same answer, different metaphor, different languaging point though was the same, right? So do it for yourself. Like, listen, religion says believe, just believe. Um, And I think a lot of people struggle there. Some people Mm -hmm. love it this is experiential. Try it. See Mm. what happens. Right. Mm. And I don't care at all what you think. Like Mm -hmm. that is what is so freeing. It means nothing to me if people don't believe in it. It's not important at all to me. That's their journey. That's their experience. Um, For me, it's transformational. For me, it's like the most healing thing I've ever done. It's so profound. It's so beautiful. Um, You know, I'm fine with keeping that <laughs> for, for people who are interested. I, you know, I'm totally honest with you, when I did yoga, I became a yoga pusher. I was like, oh yeah, there's this thing and you have to do it. And I was like this little child, like, you know, freaking out that it was like, everybody needed to try yoga because it was like changing my life, you know? And I was like, oh, I'm so annoying. Like, mm. God, right? Um, And so ever since that, that was like maybe 15 years ago, I, I started doing yoga 20 years ago. I just stopped, um, be skeptical, live your life the way you, you know, I I think we're all here for different reasons. I have no idea what that means for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You mentioned that uh, when you started doing these readings, you weren't very good at it. And over time, you got you got the hang of it. And like, what, what changed for you when you sort of worked out how to do it? Um, I don't know if there was, there wasn't like a light bulb moment for me. I, I just kind of grinded and sweated my way through, to be honest. M my life has been a series of um, being the proverbial uh, rat in the laboratory experiment that I then like to share with others to mm -hmm. hopefully uh, shorten their struggle. It just seems to turn me on. So I torture myself. I mean, like I read the four agreements, uh, great book if you haven't checked it out. Um, but I like spent a good month, like doing each one on mm -hmm. myself, like what would it be like to not take anything personally for an entire month? Like I didn't make it like a day and I'd be like, Oh, this is so hard, but I would, you know, I just, I like that process. So the Akashic realm, I didn't have a mentor or teacher. I just struggled, um, miserably. And I would try all sorts of weird shit. Like maybe if I put on headset and I, this and I, that, then it'll work. And, and then I, I'm just so curious when it comes to this stuff. So, um, you know, I, I would, uh, open the records and ask, you know, what is manifestation? Can you show me what that looks like? Like, what, what is this? What is that? Like, and, and so I just, I just sort of kept at it. Um, so yeah, no, nothing, nothing really, um, good friends that I could make an idiot of myself really mm. <laughs> like try it out. My, my twin flame, um, she was quite patient, uh, as I struggled my way through, um, different styles or techniques to, to learn how. What kinds of things do you suggest to people who are learning to access the Akashic records that maybe things that you wish you'd known when you'd started? Yeah. I mean, I teach this in my classes um, mm -hmm. now like crazy because there's so many things that I've learned, but um, the the most important thing is to practice with somebody else. Your ego is your problem, period. And so um, if I go in my own records I see something that I feel is good. The minute I think, yay, I'm out of the records. Mm. The moment I look at it and it doesn't look like what I want and I go, oh, I'm out of the records. So each time you kind of um, have those reactions on a human level, you're not in the Akashic realm anymore. You have to start over and you have to exhale and focus on the top of your head and like get deep in again. And it's exhausting and irritating and the quality falls apart. So if you practice with somebody else and you don't know them, even better, um, because you couldn't possibly know anything about them hmm. and your ego quiets a lot and you can just jump in. I have a little queuing document that I give people in the level one class. So you can practice. Um, we get in groups of a couple hundred people and, and then they can go meet up with each other or there's a community at the little soul school so they can find new people. And, and then, you know, one person will drop really deep in and the other one will help by cueing them um, to keep the energy moving. Because the more you talk and explain and go and go and go without assessing or analyzing or thinking, the more the records will work. The records stop working when your brain goes online and tries to control it. The, mm -hmm. You're being spoken through. You have to, you're like the phone booth, right? I, I mean, as soon as you recognize that Lorico has zero value, like zero mm -hmm then the energy works really, really well. And it's not to say that like my, like I am being used to express. So my vocabulary and language, or maybe understanding of things is, is being leveraged. Um, but my opinion is of no interest. No. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What makes you, I, I imagine you, Think that the Akashic records are uh, beneficent and mean well and well intentioned. Like, if so, what makes you think that? Mm. In my experience, I have never um, experienced judgment or right or wrong. It depends how you think about life. Okay. So if you are grinding towards and wanting outcomes, this is not a good modality at all. You will be irritated because it is not going to be predictive of the future. And the records are not deeply concerned about finances or 
you know, it's not going to say you should leave your spouse or you, you know, should take this job or here's how to triple down on your income. Like it's just not. So the reason I think it's, um, a good, a good system, mostly, um, beneficial is because there's no judgment and there's no right or wrong and there's no should. It's just, what is for my highest good so that I can continue to feel freer to express more of myself. That's what this is letting us do. If that is not for you, like this is not a great system, right? But I am interested in opening myself up to more of myself, to express more of myself, to be freer. I, I believe we're all looking to be happier and freer. Like, I don't think there's anybody that wants to feel trapped or unhappy, right? But our definitions of that stuff are strange. From this system's perspective, it's like the less blocked I am by sort of egoic consciousness, right? Right and wrong, culture, what my friends and family think I should be doing, all that stuff. And the more I feel connected to what is just true for me, right? The record's perspective of truth is in every single moment I'm connected in and I know what is true and I'm just taking action, rinse, repeat from there. And so it helps, it's helped me unblock, continue to open, expand, express more, be in my truth, feel more comfortable being my truth, worry about things less, never feel judged, never feel shame, right? Those are really, like, really wonderful things. And so to get advice from a system where you never feel like, like I read people who are, have severe addictions or eating disorders or trauma, I mean, severe trauma, and there's no judgment, not one drop so they can hear and heal mm. Mm. Yeah. beautiful beautiful mm. what has your like what inspired you to start the little school little soul school yeah um i you know like you look back and it's like oh i could see where it was all coming together um I just have been winging this whole thing. Like, just honestly, I was like, I walked into this Akashic record thing and I was like, oh, I'm just going to try this. And then all my, oh, I guess I can channel these books. And then what do I do with these books? And like, I'm just reading some friends and all of a sudden I'm doing it professionally. And then I'm training people. And then all of a sudden I'm training hundreds of people, right? It, it, it's just sort of been happening slowly, but surely. So the little soul school was um, really around this idea of community first. It wasn't the the teaching in um large groups came second i just wanted to create a community where soul growth um breaking down to break through felt supported i've ended up teaching the classes first because to get people in the door they're like what is it and most people don't know what it is so that then they are interested in the community aspect so i've had to sort of backpedal, <laughs> create more programmatically like um, opening experiences into this so that then like, it's like, oh yeah, I definitely wanted part of this community because what happens when you go in the records and you start working in them, you start really releasing a lot of stuff. And when we release stuff, like, who are we? Oh my God. What is this energy? What, what is happening? What is the world then? who am I in the world? And it's so freaking scary. Mm. Right. So I wanted a community for myself and I was building one and they all wanted it. And so I was like, well, let me see if I can put something together as an entrepreneur. Right. Like, I, like it kind of came full circle mm. for me to create a platform. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what are your hopes for the community and for the little soul school? You know, it's funny, um, me of like even a year ago would have had a very tangible linear answer to that. Mm. Here's my four things in this order and blah, 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 blah. Um, I have stepped into a flow state in life that is so strange. Um, I've stopped thinking past a month and I don't know. And I just let things happen and they're happening quicker, bigger, 
and more beautifully than I could have planned it. So, um, I mean, just really broadly, I want to share this beautiful system that I believe has been around for so long and hasn't gotten like, like it's fair airspace in the world for some reason, like yoga is Madame Blavetsky brought it to the States like a hundred years ago with yoga and meditation. And it just didn't, didn't find its little way. And it's so powerful. So, I mean, broadly, that's my, my, my intention, but specifically, I mean, my heart is connected to the philosophical lessons. So to get people interested in it, to learn the healing for themselves, but then these books that I wrote and the um, the philosophical side of it, like what does love mean from the Akashic Records perspective? What does self-love mean? I don't know that we're educated exactly um, about these topics properly. So then it's hard to heal them because I don't know that we understand them fully. At least the understanding for, through the Akashic realm is, is so much, it feels right to me and to people who, who read this stuff that that I've channeled through. So I'd like to build up a vocabulary, like a Akashic philosophy, if you will, mm -hmm. um, over time and, and create a school where you're okay. So if you have classrooms, um, for math or science or gym or, or right. Or humanities, like where's your soul classroom. If you've mm -hmm. come here to learn something and I've come here to learn forgiveness and you've come here to learn purpose, Where's your community of souls who are totally obsessed with that? And then mm. when you learn that and you want to learn surrender, where's that community, right? So perhaps over time, it becomes this like classroom environment for soul growth. Mm. Beautiful. What are the books that you have channeled and published? And what are the ones that are unpublished? Um. So published is uh, self-love, love, love and boundaries. You can go grab those from my site, um, Amazon. Um, mostly people are buying them off my site, but, um, I have so many, there's 10, I, I don't know that I'll remember them all, but faith control, um, 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 oh my God, forgiveness. Like there's, there's just a, another 10. I mean, I can pull up the list if you want me to look mm. at it, but I just kept asking questions about, different uh topics and time um i love the one on time and and getting these answers and so um i'm going to do audiobooks on all of them so those will be available i haven't put the other ones out to press because i mean to be honest with you most people don't purchase books these days like mm. i got a statistic that most americans buy like one book a year or something so it's a it's an exhausting and expensive process to publish them all. So I've, I've kind of held off to see how the first three. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Hmm. Coming back to you personally, uh, what do you feel is your own journey right now in your life and spiritual practice? Um, What is my journey in my life and my spiritual practice? I... Um, I mean, right now it is to, um, be the embodiment of the lessons that I'm, I'm learning, uh, to keep breaking down and break through the things that are left of my egoic identity so that I can, um, bring forward more of myself uh, communicate, I think particularly for me, communicating this stuff is, is just truth for me. I, I love it. It's one and the same for me, my spiritual practice. Um, I mean, I go on the records a lot. Um, I am all over. I do sound healing. I love that. I do meditation a lot. I do a, a lot of yoga. Um, I love trying new things. I've done psychedelics to see how those open me. Um, I spent a year last year. I got a shaman um, to see that experience. Um, so um, I don't know that I have like, I, I mean, I have some daily things, the Kashuk realm and, and meditation and yoga and um, things like that. But broadly, I try things as I feel called to, to them. Um, 
and I continue them as they feel like they help support an opening, not just sort of entertainment, right? Mm. Uh, for the most part. I mean, gong baths, I have to say, I kind of just like to do for the for the fun of it. I just find it like super relaxing. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's um, mostly my spiritual practice, yeah. If you sort of fast forwarded to the moment in your life where you are approaching your death and you are looking back on your life and, you know, say you're like 80 or 90 or whatever. And, uh, what is something that you, what qualities would you hope to live in the coming decades of your life that you would feel proud of when you die? Mm, that's a big one. Um, I mean, for me, I mean, I've said it, you know, an expression of, of my deepest, deepest truth that I'm, I'm not lying anywhere. I'm really, um, getting to the depths of self and allowing the vulnerability to, to speak them, you know, and, 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 you know, love, um, that I, that I connect to the people I care about, to humanity, that I energetically offer myself um, through work, but also just energetically through my days, that I, that I um, create a field of um, en of energy that that flows off of me. So maybe even people walking around feel a little positive uplift, right? Because that's available, um, and that 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 I. I'm that more often than not. Um, and that I unconditionally love myself knowing that I am unconditional love, that that there's no space between me and that energy um, would be a beautiful thing. I feel like I'm scratching the surface of, but I feel like that's a deeply important um, feeling that I want to be an expression of, right? Not a knowing, but, a, a, but an experience of. And and I mean, you know, it sounds trite, but that I've loved big and hard to everyone and everything that comes my way. And when I'm not, more importantly, right? Because I think we're good at being loving intermittently, um, but it's conditional and transactional. And we all have flaws and, and we come forward um, in ways that aren't ideal, right? Sometimes. But that you repair that, you you learn from it, you um, don't repeat the same mistakes, and you treat people with kindness and compassion and love more more often and as frequently as you can. I, I think if I were to end my life tomorrow, um, or at eighty, um, knowing that I expressed as much as I could of myself from the depths of my soul, and and that I and I loved as big as I, I feel like we can because I think we hold a lot. Um, and like fear, the mind didn't sort of convince me out of the massive expressions in all ways to individuals or, or in, in work that that's the, that's the dream for me. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, we've covered a lot of territory. I wonder, is there anything else that you'd like to talk more about or uh, speak more about? I mean, you're just like an exceptional interviewer. I mean, um, I'm, I guess I'm curious where this stuff lands for you personally and your own practice, your own life. Um, what you find supportive about the Akashic records, if you're willing to share that at all, or we could have a little discussion around mm -hmm. that, um, for your listeners. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think I'd been, I don't know, I, I'd sort of bumped into different territories around channeling for a few years. And uh, I've had some other people on the podcast about this as well, and uh, just kind of been exploring it on my own the last couple of years. And um, and then when I got that reply about, hey, have you had your Akashic Records read? 
uh, that I mentioned earlier. There's this other tweet that I wrote that's like something like uh, the universe makes a certain sound when it knocks on your door, like recognize, learn to recognize that sound and listen to it. And um, I think I put it slightly differently, but um, it really had that sound of like, oh, um, there was such a weird reply to get to this situation. And like, it wasn't like, a, I don't know, on, sometimes on Twitter, people have bad replies that are just like aggressive or like mean or something. And I, I tend to sort of avoid that. And uh, this was just like kind of out of left field. It was like, huh, wh why did you ask that? And uh, so I was like, okay, I will, th the universe is knocking and I'll go get my Akashic records read. And uh, she connected me with you, of course. And um, I think, you know, going into something like that, there's definitely, uh, yeah, I've had different experiences of like very positive ones like kind of negative ones in between with different people and different modalities. And so there's sort of this part comes up that's like suspicious or skeptical or something. And just like within seconds of meeting you, I was like, okay, like one, she can do the thing. There's a thing here and I don't know yet what it is, but she can do the thing. And also just, yeah, kind of how you're speaking to it earlier, like in contrast with, um, you know, how you experienced yoga earlier in your life when you're like pushing people on that like you should really try yoga like there was just none of that energy from you like i could tell that you really didn't care what i thought or what my experience was in in like in a good way that was just like letting me have my experience and if i liked it great and if i didn't it was like you you were centered in yourself and knew the value of it and um and then of course the the things that you said that you sort of channeled through the akashic records were extremely profound i thought that you said things that I, I almost i've had this experience sometimes with like massage or other other things where like it's such an it can be such an intense experience that you almost have to digest it for like a day or two or a week afterwards we're just like what just happened and like even during the call it was like that for me of like just so much coming in and it was all it was all positive and clarifying and really helpful but it was just you know it was an hour call and it felt like three hours or something. It was just, there's so much there. And, um, and I had to really sit with it and digest it and reflect on it. And, um, yeah, the, the things that you said were very perceptive and relevant and, uh, like on the, on the one hand, the things that you said sort of factually were both true and helpful and then the metaphors that you used were very specific to me. And I asked about other people and they were, the metaphors were like specific to those people. It's like, you didn't know me, you didn't know about these other people. And it was just like, yep, that's on the, on the, on the nose. And so that really, you know, I'd had, I'd had that kind of uh, experience before through different kinds of channeling, but this was a new kind and uh, just um, very like clear what it was and what the intention was. And yeah, what you said about there not being judgment or it just being there to help you move forward was very clear. I could feel that. And it was like, there were some very profound truths that were almost like, like if I had a sticker on the back of my shirt or something and you were like, Hey, there's a, it was like something I couldn't quite see for myself, but that you point out and it was like, Oh, that's obvious now that you say that. And um, oh, that's such a cute way of saying it. Yeah. 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 Right. Because as soon as it's said, you go, oh, but of course, but you also knew that you would never get to a place where you could say it. It's the strangest feeling. That's a really beautiful point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that made me, I don't know, I think I really appreciated that session and have been digesting it since then in different ways. And then, you know, I also took the, as I said, the intro class that you have on the little soul school and have been trying it on my own. And I think, I think probably just from doing a lot of meditation and stuff like that, it was like, yep, there, here's the thing, like we're in and practice with uh, a friend of mine and um, yeah, like getting the hang of it a little bit, but it's just like very clear access to a, a specific, almost like frequency or wavelength or something like that. And um, uh, that's been very helpful to explore. And uh, yeah, something I both want to learn more about for myself and kind of hear from you how you thought about it and and then share that with people and and be like yep this is yeah I, I loved what you said about like I mean you know I haven't uh come out as gay or something like that but like when when you're like oh that was that was easier than coming out as spiritual it's like yeah it's it's really vulnerable to be like hey I've been trying this like channeling stuff and the Akashic Records stuff and 
going i mean there's other like pretty woo things that i've got into the, especially the last couple of years is you know i i was sort of coming from a buddhist background and, and one nice thing about buddhism is like it's been around for 2500 years and like people might not agree with it they might not want to do it themselves but they're not like oh weird you're a buddhist like that's weird uh it's like yeah that makes sense but and likewise this has been around for that long and and so is yoga and mm -hmm. it, it's funny that the time doesn't always work it's just the popularity of it like some things have been accepted in culture like buddhism and some haven't it, but they're but they're you know tried and true over long, long periods of time, right? Like ayahuasca has been around forever and it's mm -hmm. been a part of ceremony for so many people, but it's like, oh, what is that? You know, and it's funny what falls in the skeptical category and um, not to interrupt you, but I have these beautiful conversations with my dad, who's a, you know, world famous physician. And, and, and I was like, dad, you know, you have faith in believing in death as nothing. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, you, ha I said, the way that a scientist understands truth is by running studies and they have to get, you know, double blind placebo studies done, or you guys do not accept it as fact. And he's like, right. And I'm like, well, you haven't done a study on death. You haven't killed 50 people and then seen who comes home and who doesn't. It was like, you, you haven't, you, you can't actually study death. Like there's no way to do it. And so by saying it's nothing is the same as saying that when I look out at the horizon, I think the world ends. You're just saying based on your perception, which we know is terrible, we don't see anything at the time of death. So we believe that there is nothing, but you haven't done what scientists do. And it was the only argument that actually cracked him of his <laughs> skepticism because I'm using his own language. And I was like, listen, if you haven't done it scientifically, then you're in the faith category because you're <laughs> believing in something without the actual research. And it needs to not only be study but it needs to be replicatable and so you have to have like a huge huge sample size and then you have to do the data and then you have to publish the papers and then you can say death is in fact this but you, you guys haven't done that so he was like you got me and i was like yes you got him <laughs> and i was yeah. like so it, but for me that was a big turning point too to realize that um faith is something that everybody's doing on this topic whether you're atheist or you're full on anything the akashic realm everything so when you ask me what do i believe i just i don't know i don't know this is something that for me there is more evidence here than there is with the atheist because i and and structured religions because i'm in the experiment and i am talking to people like yourself and I'm telling them about, the, like, there's zero possible way that I know these facts about people, and yet I do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I can do it over and over. It's replicatable, right? So it feels more scientific to me than the science answer for death, right? I mean, grain of salt, caveat, I, mm. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that that's my that's my one, like, claim to fame. I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> I broke the Doogie Howser of, uh, for those who are younger, it's, it's a television show of, uh, my dad went to college at 15 and, and he's like prodigal. And I was like, I did it. <laughs> wow. Wow. I love that. That well, of course the interaction with your dad, but also just that everybody has faith about these things. And, um, I think that's definitely how it is for me, they, you know, whatever their position is. But for me, it's like, I, I have I have no proof of reincarnation, but I just over the years come to it's like that's the thing that makes sense to me. Like it makes basically it's for me, it's like either I can believe in reincarnation and a lot of my life makes a lot of sense to me. Weird things, weird aspects of my life, different details, like, yep, that could make sense with reincarnation. Or it's like, oh, there's no reincarnation, it's just arbitrary. And it's like, that's, that's, that's a, that is a possible explanation, but it's not very satisfying. And then it's just like weird and random. And uh, so I, I choose to, it just makes so much more sense to me to believe in reincarnation and um, yeah. 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 We have to put language to it. And so, and we don't know. And so then the question for me became, I, I'm living and I, and I want to be happy. And this feels good. So maybe, maybe I'll die and I become all worms and nothing. Well, okay. Well, this was way more entertaining. So 
I, I mean, wh who cares? Like, I'm not harming anybody. It's not, if in the end, nothing matters and, and we're here and there's no meaning to any of it, well, then it doesn't matter. If there's something else and we don't know, then we don't know. So it is what it is. Um, I don't know. I For me, this is the thing that feels most truthful. Um, something in me aligns to it, plus or minus. I, I don't think we have it right. I still think our languaging. I mean, when you get into the records and you start asking questions about like time, and that there is none and everything is happening in an infinite moment with an infinite set of possibilities and all time blah, 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 blah. You're like, what? Like, mm -hmm. so I don't think our brains could comprehend the, the infinite nature of the universe. There's this beautiful Netflix called, um, uh, uh, something into the infinite. Um, I'll, I'll think of it in a second, but it, it's uh, a whole bunch of physicists talking about infinity and it's like, you just watch them try to explain the math of, of infinity. And then they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't know. That doesn't make a ton of sense. We understand. Like it doesn't make sense when you think about the totality and infinite nature that, you know, the time space in, in all of the universe, um, we, we don't get it. So to sit here and claim, um, I, I think is, is quite ignorant at this point in my life for me. So I just, I just sort of embrace the, the lack of knowing. And in the short term, this makes the most sense. And it's fun. I, I, I'm, I feel I feel it's um, improved my life. Hmm. Hmm. So um, I, I feel calmer and more at peace. And the ideas resonate in a way that um, makes sense to me. And it helps me live my life in a freer way. So I think for anybody, whatever you find, you know, no judgment. Um, if it does that and it doesn't harm others, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think there's this point that we come to of, you know, like conviction or something where uh, we see, oh yeah, this is this is just it. This is it for me. And like, I can't argue with myself and my own experience of these things anymore. Like, I don't have to explain it to anyone else or justify it, but like this, this is, yep, that's it there, there. And I, I think that's, in a certain way, I'm realizing in this moment that that kind of conviction is the beginning of spiritual maturity because you aren't outsourcing what you believe to anyone else or a teacher, a book, a community. You're just like, no, this is what is true for me. And then, you know, it's not like, yeah, you don't know everything. You don't have all the answers, but like, I know, like for me in my path, like love has been very important and the heart. And it's like, yep, I know that there's something here that's very important to my life. Like have to cultivate love and the path of the heart. And that's not anyone external telling me that that's not some scripture. That's just like, yep, that's my truth or, or any number of things like that. And uh, I think that's the beginning of the spiritual maturity there. Yeah, that's right. Because when you're trying to convince others, in my opinion, the question is why, mm. right? If, if, um, I mean, first of all, I don't, I don't know that we can ever really, I mean, it's even when you try to convince a friend of something super simple, it's really a frustrating process. If they're not open to hearing you, you know, you're just annoying them. You're annoying yourself, right? Like, even if you're like really liked a movie and they really didn't like it, it's exhausting, right? So why, why, why do you need somebody to love a movie if they didn't love the movie, right? And so likewise with a spiritual belief, what's in it for you? So I would challenge somebody to ask themselves that question, right? And for me, it was like, I guess if enough people confirmed my perspective, then I would feel more comfortable in it, right? Mm. And that means that I don't have a conviction of my own, mm. I'm like outsourcing a large part of my... um um, faith in my own ability to choose what's true for me without needing to be approved of, right. Or accepted or whatever. And, and, and I think a big part of the human experience is wanting social acceptance, right? I mean, we're social beings. I, I mean, the brain is designed, right? Like, you know, we used to live in community and if you were outed from the community, you didn't eat, you'd die, you know, we're not going to die anymore, but our brains have, have been adapted to the reality like i could live alone for the rest of my life i'm not gonna die you mm. know um i mean there are some studies around happiness and and health that were better when we're 
in partnerships or at least with community, but you're not going to die the way you used to. So I just think like, um, there's some weird artifacts in, in our minds that suggest things, but, um, you know, what is it within you that, that needs that? And it, I think that's a really fun thing to, to think about and, and see if you can let go of, right. Cause, mm -hmm. um, the process of um, standing in your own truth and your own power as your own expression in this life, in my opinion, is letting go of that need, you know, from others mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and feeling like if I say it, it's enough for me. Why do I need, I, you know, I like a certain food a certain way. Do you need to like that? Mm -hmm. What does that do for me? If, if you do, what does it do for me if you don't? Right. So, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Hmm. Is there anything else that you'd like to share or add? I mean, nothing that comes to mind. I just deeply appreciate and enjoy this conversation. Thank you so much for creating an environment for me to share with this kind of depth. It's as uh, refreshing and, and, and invigorating to me. Hmm. Mm, I'm so glad. And yeah, thank you for finding the time and sharing yourself so fully. And I hope that people check out your materials and learn more about the Akashic Records. So yeah, thanks, friend. Thank you.